Hi, I'm Kelly Shanley. I'm the president and CEO of the Broward Center for the Performing Arts, and we're happy to welcome all of you to our virtual town hall. We're going to give you an insider look at everything we're doing to get Broadway back on the road and back to the Broward Center. Because we know that's what all of you are looking forward to. And believe me when I tell you, all of us at the Broward Center are so looking forward to having you back in our theaters. There's much that needs to be done in order to get us to that point. And that's why we'll be sharing with you in, in this town hall, all of the things we're doing to prepare. We'll be talking about the protocols we're putting in place to make sure that when you return to the Broward Center, you can do it safely and comfortably. And we'll be getting some insights from producers and show representatives in New York will tell us about what they're doing to get back on the road. And we'll review the changes that we've made to the season and answer some of your questions. So to do all that, I'm joined here tonight by Susie Kreisha, president of the Broadway Across America, our longtime partner in bringing Broadway to Fort Lauderdale. Susie, let's get started. What can you tell us? Hey, Kelly, it's good to see you for our virtual town hall. I would like to start by thanking all of our Broadway and Fort Lauderdale subscribers and all of our Broadway fans for sticking with us. It really means so much to us to have all of your loyalty and your support. So as you know, Kelly, we've been working hard with you and your team to bring live theater back to the Broward Center. And a large part of that process has been the constant communication with producers, with show representatives, all of whom represent the touring shows across the country. I have to tell you that this process, it's like a huge complex jigsaw puzzle. It's, it's, a, it's a point where all of the pieces of that puzzle in all the markets across North America have to fit together. So now we're going to pull back the curtain to share with you some of the challenges that we face in getting shows back on the road. Okay, thanks Susie. Let's start with a quick status report on what's happening here at the Broward Center. And I have to say, it's certainly hard to describe the impact as anything less than devastating. We've had to cancel or postpone more than 500 performances through the end of this year. And almost 90% of the people who would normally be employed here at the Broward Center this time of year simply aren't. The Broward Center generates over 130 million in economic impact annually for our community. And when our economic engine isn't running, the impact is also felt by local vendors, restaurants, businesses, and hotels. So while we are eager to get back to business, we know that won't happen until it's safe for our community. And our business is likely to be one of the last to return because in order for touring shows to come back, we'll need to be able to operate at 100% of our capacity. Now, during this shutdown, we've changed course and gotten a little creative about the things we're doing. We've produced streaming shows with local artists. We've moved our arts and education programs to a virtual format, and we've been producing virtual programs for Broward County school students during their virtual learning experience. Coming up, we've got a live streaming concert with Patty Lapone that I think you will all enjoy. And we've been doing donor events to where, which are helping us raise money for the Road to Recovery campaign. Now, many of you have asked how you can help the Broward Center get through this crisis. And first of all, we're so grateful that you asked. I mentioned that we're on a pretty tough road to recovery and it's been made more difficult by the fact that the Broward Center for the Performing Arts was not eligible for the Paycheck Protection Program, which provided much needed funding to other theaters and small businesses like ours. So the answer is this, if you're interested in helping us out, visit our website and you can do one of three things. Make a contribution to our Road to Recovery campaign, or you can also become a member or renew your membership. You can also simply purchase our live streaming offerings. All of those things will help support the Broward Center's return to readiness, and we deeply appreciate that support. Now, recently, with the health of our community improving, some of the restrictions have been lifted, and you'll begin to see some performances and events occurring back here on our campus in a physically distanced format. We've begun classes on site at the Miniachi Arts Education Center, and performances are being scheduled in the Amateur Theater and outdoors in our Peck Courtyard. Once again, all activities are gonna require limited capacity, physical distancing, and face coverings. 
but check out our website for details on events that are coming up and the safety protocols that we have in place. And here to give you a little bit more information on health and safety protocols for venues like ours is an interview with Dr. Joseph Allen. He's an associate professor at Harvard University's T.H. Chan School of Public Health. There are steps that the theaters can take to be able to welcome an audience back without social distancing before a vaccine is available to everybody. So what are those steps we're talking about? Well, so first, it's really nice to talk with you and to talk to the community. I know everyone is really anxious at this time and consumer sentiment is down about doing anything, going to a restaurant, going out to the theater again, uh, and that's totally understandable. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the types of controls we can put in place that we know can keep people safe. And largely, these are derived from what we know is working in hospitals already. So in other words, in hospitals, they do a suite of what we call non-pharmaceutical interventions, or NPIs. That's universal masking, uh, that's hand washing, and that's good building level controls, like good ventilation and good filtration. What can't they do in a hospital? They can't distance, right? Because they're working with patients, people who are sick. So even in a high risk environment where you can't physically distance, we've been able to really drive down risk to healthcare workers since March with these basic set of very important, basic but important set of control measures. Audience, audience plays a big part in all this, obviously. What are the steps an audience should take when they're welcomed back to the theater? Yeah, so this is really important because um, really the only way through this is with a large degree of social trust. Mm -hmm. and we tend to think about it in terms of creating a culture of health, safety, and shared responsibility. The shared responsibility is important, right? The theater has to do its job in terms of the building, the managing the flows of people, performers will do their job in terms of what all the protections and precautions that need to be in place before the actual event. But the audience has a role to play too. They have to wear masks. They have to distance in the lobby. They have to follow the signage and, and follow the rules on queuing. And I also think it's a bit of an adjustment in terms of expectations. This won't be theater as usual. It shouldn't be. We're in the middle of a pandemic. So if we want to go back to these things, we're all going to have to do our own part here. We're going to have to play by the rules. It's going to be masks on. Could rapid testing be a solution for theaters? Yeah, I think it's going to be key. I want to be clear, though, that testing is not the only thing that needs to be done, but absolutely. Uh, the way, and the way we think about it is a layered defense approach, right? So we're talking about healthy building strategies, that's a layer. Masking, that's a layer. Uh, hand washing, that's another, bit, another layer. And when you add all these layers on top of each other, there's no such thing as zero risk, but you start to drive down risk. You can really reduce risk significantly. Now think about testing as one more layer up front, right? The testing is not perfect, but it's actually pretty good at this point. And if you add that layer on, these rapid tests. People could take it day of, show that they're clear, still come to the theater, wear a mask, follow all the other rules, and that would also drive down risk significantly, as long as it's part of a holistic risk reduction strategy. And we know that these rapid tests are coming online. Uh, there are many more available. There are other platforms ready to come. I suspect this kind of rapid testing will be part of every theater's uh, risk reduction strategy as we move into 2021. I mean, really, theater is, arts is the next you know, place. We've seen it in restaurants. We're seeing it in a number, in, in different stores now. Um, it makes sense that we're gonna be able to do this with the theater, but we all have to, you know, this is really a community effort. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we're starting to see, right, as you mentioned, restaurants, some airlines have started to, to use uh, rapid testing. Uh, these platforms work, they're ready to go. I think it's gonna take a, an ed some education with the public and consumers about how they work and and why they work, but also the limitations. So we say it's not just you do this test and then you, it's a free for all. You take this test, it's one more layer and we have enough controls in place. We can start to do some of the things again that are what make us us, the things where we can get out and about, see other people, see our friends, see an, a performance, um, but it's gonna involve some really, uh, you know, some precautions. The precautions are gonna have to be in place, um, but I'm confident we can get there. Uh, you know, we know how to keep people safe in buildings done this for a long time. Uh, and we, so we know what needs to be done and we know a lot about this virus now. Uh, and if you follow stringent protocols, then I'm confident we can keep people safe. So speaking of safety protocols, we're making lots of changes here at the Broward Center to ensure the safety of all of you, our artists, our staff, and our volunteers. 
And to do that, we're getting guidance and direction from our partners at Cleveland Clinic. They've been right by our side from the very beginning with their team of health professionals and infectious disease experts. And they've helped us develop a plan that will meet or exceed local federal guidelines and keep everyone involved in a safe and comfortable environment. I'm also serving on a national advisory committee to develop standards for the performing arts industry across the country. And that's given me access to the top epidemiologists out there and industrial hygienists like Dr. Allen that have access to all the latest science regarding COVID. So as the situation continues to evolve, our safety protocols can also evolve. And you can count on us to make sure the right protocols will be in place when you arrive at the center. So Susie, I know Broadway tours themselves are facing a lot of challenges as they try to get back out on the road. What can you tell us about what's been happening in New York? You're right, Kelly. It's, it's been a very challenging time for everybody. And we're living in these really crazy, complicated times. And that does apply to the Broadway business as well. The reality is that social distancing will not work for live theater for many reasons, not the least of which is the energy and the excitement that we all experience when we're together at the Broward Center. There's also significant financial risks that contribute to why we can't social distance for live theater. And there's the challenge of booking touring shows and the need for contiguous markets to line up for a successful route. Look, there's so many unknowns and there's so many questions out there, but what we know is that the health and safety of everyone is paramount. So with that in mind, we have recently announced that the engagements of the band's visit, the prom, and Pretty Woman the Musical are all being rescheduled, and we have sent that programming notification out to all of our subscribers. But that said, I want to stress and I want to let everyone know that the value of your ticket is safe. Here's the thing. I, I mean, I know everyone has a lot of questions. So we've asked two colleagues who are in the middle of this whole process to record some thoughts for us to share with you to give you a better idea of what's going on behind the scenes. Up first is Sue Frost. She's the Tony Award winning producer of Come From Away and Memphis the Musical. Sue's going to share some behind the scenes information on what it takes to produce a Broadway show. Hi, I'm Sue Frost and I'm the producer of the musical Come From Away. I'm here to tell you a little bit about the challenges we producers are facing as we look toward bringing our shows back to the road. The most important thing for us right now is, of course, health and safety of our company and of the audience. Uh, to talk a little bit about the challenges we have keeping our company safe, um, my show, Come From Away, is a relatively small show, which means we travel with about 60 people. And that means we have to think about their safety as we move from city to city, whether we're on an airplane or whether we're on a bus. We have to think about moving in and out of hotels. What are those hotels like? Do they have safety protocols? Are they cleaned regularly? We're working with the unions who are very concerned about their, their members and making sure that when they come back, they're in, um, in a safe environment. And then when we're at the theater, we're backstage together, we're in dressing rooms together, we're interacting with your local crews. Uh, some of our orchestras are interacting with uh, local musicians in a crowded orchestra pit. How do we protect everyone? So all of those things are things that we think about uh, and we're working on and trying to develop a plan so that when we do come back, we can stay back and we can keep everybody uh, performing. Remounting our show is going to um, present its own set of challenges, but nothing like the challenges that a brand new show is going to face because not only do they have to put a show up from scratch and cast it and rehearse it and costume it and build the scenery, all of that has to happen in a safe environment, in, a, uh, in an environment where people are, are, are protected and, uh, and where we know that um, the end result is going to be uh, realized in a timely fashion. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a lot to think about, but think about all of these tours as their own, um, their own worlds. And they travel around from place to place uh, with uh, 
truckloads of scenery and costumes and props and all of the actors and stage managers and company managers and band and crew and all of those little pieces that have to go back together again. And we have to know that the scenery's running smoothly, the costumes still fit, and the lights and the sound equipment are still working. One of the reasons it's gonna take us a while to come back is we need to come back to full houses. Uh, the experience of uh, sharing a Broadway show between the actor and the audience is, um, is unique and special. And socially distanced audiences are not going to create anywhere near the same feeling that a house full of people laughing, crying, clapping does. It is also not possible for us to make this work financially. We need to know that uh, we can accommodate all of the subscribers in the week that we're in town. We need to know that we can um, meet our financial model and what it takes for us to travel from town to town, what it takes for us to present the show, uh, that financial model requires full houses. But mostly it is that relationship between our actors, between our performers and you and the energy that, um, that you both feed off of creates that unique experience, which is a Broadway show. But we're gonna get there. Don't you worry, we're gonna get there. Sue mentions that the shows travel city to city. That means that the cast and crew travel by bus or plane and the sets, costumes and props all travel in tractor trailers. So depending on the size of the show, a producer needs 30 to 40 weeks of eight performances per week in order to just break even on the cost to mount and tour a show. Those weeks need to be contiguous and the tour needs to move across the country in a manner that makes sense geographically. As I said earlier, routing a tour across the country is, it's like a big jigsaw puzzle. And that process typically takes about 18 to 24 months in advance. The entire industry has been working tirelessly to reroute the 40 Broadway shows that tour across the US and Canada in a typical year. So here to tell us a little bit more about how tours cross the country is Meredith Blair, president of the Booking Group. Hi, my name is Meredith Blair. I'm the president of the Booking Group and I represent the national tours of Hamilton, Dear Evan Hansen, Come From Away, Mean Girls, uh, the Book of Mormon, To Kill a Mockingbird, and many others. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about the process of booking a tour. So to start with the basics, um, in order to get a show from point A to point B, um, you have to determine the size of the show, which determines how quickly you can travel. Um, one of our objectives is to uh, open in a given city on a Tuesday and close on a Sunday. Um, needless to say, some markets are closer to each other than others. Shows travel anywhere from uh, a three to a four truck show to 25 to 30 trucks. Those are the big blockbusters. Uh, generally speaking, most touring shows travel in anywhere from five to eight trucks. The challenges of routing a tour are the availability of the venues. Um, so if I'm starting in Buffalo, the next logical thing would be to go to Rochester or to go to Cleveland. But the venue that I need to go to next may not be available because they've got another show then, or the symphony is in the venue then, or there's a graduation, or there's any number of things or other commitments that the venue may have that don't make it available. So one of the challenges now in the current climate in booking a contiguous tour is that we don't know, we don't necessarily have any consistency in um, what states are open when. So if I'm trying to get a show across the country, I need to know that I can get from uh, Ohio to Iowa and that the states in between are open for business. But um, those, that's one of the many challenges that we're all trying to face in, in many different uh, walks of life, not just in the theater business. The process has changed a little bit for us. You no, know, it's changed a great deal for us over the past several months, um, having dealt, having to deal with um, the shutdowns across the nation. So we are actively trying to put the pieces of the puzzle back together multiple times as the landscape keeps changing and as the timing keeps changing and as we continue, unfortunately, to live in a world where we don't have all the answers yet. So we're dealing with that reality and we're booking and we're rebooking and we will continue to rebook until we can get these shows back on the road and back to your cities. That's the goal. Okay, well, Susie, that was a lot of great information we got from Sue and Meredith on a couple of really important topics. 
that I think actually answer a lot of the questions that we got uh, from our subscribers. Uh, we do have a couple more here that really generated a lot of common type questions centered around these two things. And I'll, I'll give the first one to you. Um, the question is this, we are at risk and we do not feel comfortable returning until there is a vaccine. But we've been subscribers for 15 years and we don't want to lose our seats. Are you going to allow us to hold on to our locations? That is a very commonly asked question, Kelly. And I, I want to say that we certainly understand and that's why working with you and your team, we're doing everything that we can to keep everyone as safe as possible. Our suggestion is, is to just be patient. Just be patient for now, hold on to your seats and then make that determination based on circumstances when we are able to reopen. And when we do reopen, if you still feel uncomfortable, we'll be more than willing to do everything that we can to help manage your subscription. I just wanna go back to something I had said earlier, and this definitely applies to this situation. I wanna let you know, I wanna let everyone know that if we need to cancel any performance at any time for any reason, the value of your ticket is safe. That's great, Susie. And it is, you know, one of the most important questions that folks have been asking. And the advice really I think you're giving is the best. There's so much we don't know yet about how this is all going to work out for us. And as we all get more educated, as, you know, treatments become available and vaccines get out there, the whole landscape's going to change. So folks like this who have those concerns are going to have more information down the road to make their decision. The best thing to do is sit tight right now, hold on to your seats and wait for everything to develop. I got another question here. Are you going to cancel the entire season? If so, does our money go to toward the next season? Um, I'll take this and Susie, you can chime in, but um, I think the most important thing to understand is what we're trying to do is avoid canceling anything. We're trying to preserve this season and just move it down the road to a point where it's gonna be safe for you to attend and we can do performances at 100% capacity. So our top priority is to keep all of your shows and welcome you back to the center to enjoy those shows when the time is right. But as Susie said, if we do have to cancel any performance at any time for any reason, the value of your tickets is safe and you will have the option to receive a credit, uh, a refund, or if you would like to donate your tickets to the Broward Center, you can donate the value of them back to the Broward Center. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, we need that kind of help. So those are the options that'll be available to somebody in this person's position. That's right, Kelly. I mean, I think you, you answered it perfectly. The thing I would like to say also is, is that, again, we appreciate everybody sticking with us. I know this has been a, a challenging and confusing time, but the fact that um, we've gotten so many nice comments and emails from our subscribers, it really means a lot. So stick with us. Okay, well that covers the most commonly asked questions that we received. Susie, anything else you think you wanna cover? I think, uh, I think we've covered a lot, Kelly, and, and I think we're ready to wrap it up. I, I hope we've provided some insights and background for everyone to more fully understand what happens behind the scenes, the logistics, and everything that is required for us to be able to welcome you back to the Broward Center. And I have to tell you, and I believe this from the bottom of my heart, that Broadway will be back, and trust me, it will be worth the wait. Well, we've all got that to look forward to, and I know everybody does. So I'll just wrap up by saying, don't forget to visit our website and our social channels to stay connected to what's happening here at the Broward Center and all the latest news, and also find the best ways to help the Broward Center through this challenging time. Remember, you can give to the Road to Recovery campaign, you can become a member, or simply buy some of our stream performances that we're offering, and I'm sure you're gonna enjoy those. It all helps, and we're grateful for the help, and thanks for taking the time to join us for this town hall. Stay safe. Stay connected and be well.